Yes, that's because I record all the lectures and upload them to YouTube. So you or your best friend that lives in Tanzania can watch them if you so desire. My best friend in Tanzania, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's funny. My, my quantum physics class is reasonably popular overseas. <laughs> Not so much with my own quantum wow. physics students. I had somebody send me an email thanking me. He said he never would have gotten through his quantum class without having my quantum lectures. But, uh, yeah. It made me feel good. At least, you know, somebody appreciates them, even if it's not my own students. Okay, welcome to physical science class. Yes, we only have five students here. We'll be meeting Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here. And yes, I say Wednesday funny because I'm odd. Um, and then we have lab in the same room again Thursday afternoons. So anytime we have class, it'll be here. Our textbook, Conceptual Physics, Physical Science, excuse me, 6th edition, by Hewitt and a few other people. And there's also a lab manual for Conceptual Physics by Bayer and everyone. And so our labs are coming out of that lab book, except for one. One of them I wrote myself. Just this is lab time for... Um, yeah, because on mine it said 2 to 4.30. Oh, yeah, that's totally wrong. It's supposed to be two to two, four fifty. A ladder rolls up for a minute. I'm over here like I got glasses on. That's a little, a little embarrassing. Yeah. Question. Yes. Do we need the book today? Because I haven't been able to get my book. Um. No. No. Um. The the textbook, the homework prompts come out of the textbook, and the textbook has explanation. I'm teaching along with the textbook. The homework problems I will actually post on Google as well, so you can read the homework problems without the textbook. But obviously, it's a lot easier to answer them having the textbook and being able to go back and read the appropriate material that is related to. So we've got the, the textbook, the correction on the time. I do thank you for that. That would be ever so embarrassing. I probably had it wrong last year and didn't notice it. Okay, the objectives of the course is to introduce you to basic concepts across a number of fields in science and the scientific method. Is anyone here not an education major? No, you're all education majors. Hence, you all know my wife, Amy Webb, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I just had to throw that in, I'm sorry. So, if you're going to be teaching science to your kids, it's important, I believe, as a teacher, of course, that means it's going to be important for this class, that you understand what science is about, what the basis of science is, which is the, the scientific method. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time, actually, today just talking about that scientific method, how we understand the world scientifically, which is different than how we understand the world, for instance, theologically. Um, so it's important for me that you understand what the scientific method is. And to that end, you're going to have two test questions that you can already be absolutely assured of. On the first exam and on the final exam, you're going to have a test question that asks you to list the four abbreviated steps that I use for the scientific method. And then I'm going to give you an observation, which you won't know the observation beforehand. And then you're going to have to actually apply the scientific method to that observation. So that's two test questions that you know are coming up already. And those test questions are worth like 10% of the exam. Yes? How many tests are we going to have? Um, how many tests are we going to have? We're going to have um, one test on physics, one test on chemistry, one test on, um, I, I think there's a total of four, but it might be only three. Okay. Might be one on physics, one on chemistry. And then the final exam. I, it's, it's in the syllabus, I just don't remember. I have to get to that point in the lecture. Um, these other things I have listed are important. Identifying major areas of physical science. Physical science we have, well, I already listed physics and chemistry. Those are the two that are going to dominate our time. But then we also have earth science, that is geology. And we have astronomy and meteorology. And to go together, those are the things in physical science. Of course, we have physical science and we have biological science. Biological science, I think our textbook says biological science is more complicated 
because you're dealing with these living things that are like little, little magic beasts as far as my physics brain says. So we're not doing biological or life science in this class, but we're doing basically the rest of science. So I want you to be able to identify these major areas. I've already talked about scientific method enough. Be able to take scientific data and draw conclusions based on the information. So another question I'm going to give you is going to give you some scientific data and have you say, now what, what conclusion can I draw from having this data? And then we have the more mundane, being able to solve problems. Some problems you'll be solving mathematically. Now the math in this class is not super intense, but there is math. And some problems you're putting ideas together to figure out what's going to happen. And then we have understand how scientific knowledge benefits society. As a scientist, I truly believe that scientific knowledge benefits us. You know, I just compare when I was a wee one, you know, I, we had, when we came to America, my parents had the World Book Encyclopedia. I don't know where they got it from. And me and my siblings, we all read the entire thing. You know, it's trying to understand the world around us. But science has given us advances so that now you have your cell phone sitting in front of you. By, by the way, I went to a Nobel laureate giving a lecture on teaching methodology. And he said that just having your cell phone on the table lowers the amount you learn in the class, even if it's turned off, just because it distracts you. Um, it's exciting. Yeah, I know. It's exciting because, of course, everyone has it out. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's where we live in this world, um, <clears throat> which brings us to class in the corner. But the, the scientific advances that we have made in my lifetime have made the world very different and we can communicate so easily. When, when I was born, my dad had already gone to Africa to be a missionary. I was born in California. My parents had agreed that I would be named Thomas Lee Webb. And it wasn't until I was five weeks old that my dad first saw me and first found out my name was Richard. Because communication, it just didn't exist. And so the world is so different today because of scientific knowledge. Um, of course, I'm going to skip over the course description. Classroom decorum. I, I am not a great disciplinarian. You guys will have to be better disciplinarians than me if you're going to be successful teachers. That's kind of why I'm doing college instead of grade school um, or high school. But I would request that you don't use your phones except for if it's something like I ask, I don't know, you can look it up on the phone and help me out, yeah, that's good. Um, but don't use your phones for, you know, like, uh, text somebody, or this actually happened last semester, in the middle of lecture, somebody's phone rang, the student answered it and was carrying on a conversation at normal conversation levels in the middle of lecture. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that was something I never expected. And I talked to the student after class, but that's how we my my discipline lies. I didn't even talk to the student during class, which really I should have chased them, but I don't want to see them feel bad, you know? But we can use them for like, oh, my textbooks are online. Yes, yeah, right. That, that's, that's an appropriate usage. Yeah, like there's a PDF of our book that we have. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm, I want you to be able to use your tools and not be like, well, I guess I'll have to not learn today because teacher has a rule. Okay. Accommodations, if you have a learning difference, make sure that you communicate with the TLC and, and then communicate from them to me so that we can make appropriate accommodations. Um, academic integrity, I believe the last page of the little pack I gave you is a thing about Union College's academic integrity policy. Um, it's important to just specify before we start what is and what is not um, allowable. So first of all, homework. I expect you to work with others on your homework yeah. because, you know, as, as the Steve Martin movie says, two brains are better than one. And you might have a problem you don't understand that your friend understands and they understand, uh, you know, you understand this one, they understand that one. You can explain to each other and you both learn better. So I expect you to work with others because that's a smart way of learning. But you shouldn't be copying. You shouldn't have, you know, friend A, I didn't have time to do the assignment. Friend B, oh, I did it, it was easy. Here, friend A, okay, I write down all the answers. That would be considered an academic integrity violation for both people, both the one that 
said, here, use mine, and the person who you know, copied down from the other person. Why such a big deal? Because the goal is for you to learn. We don't apply it, we don't do homework just so we can give you work and you know, be happy that our students are spending their time. We give you homework to help you learn the material. And then on the test, the test is much more credit toward your final grade than the homework because that's where we see if you actually did learn by going through that process. So you're ultimately you're harming yourself if you are not learning what you're supposed to learn with the homework. Okay, so um, on tests, you won't be allowed to have a cell phone with you. If you're found with a cell phone with you, even if it's turned off, you'll get a zero on the exam. So we have to leave it in our room? Oh, well, you can leave it in the cubbies in the front or something, you know, put your backpack in front with it in. Yeah, will you remind us of that? Before? I will, before yes, everything yes, yes. If I forget that. Yeah. It's, it's not a game of gotcha, <laughs> right? It's not, ha <laughs> you forgot. It's, I want students to be successful, and I want to make sure okay. that there's no, I've, I've had situations where students were trying to cheat off of the cell phone. And it's always kind of hard to pinpoint because, you know, they turn it off before you get there. You don't know what they had, you know, depending on how sly a student is. You can go to different ways. That's why I just have the, the zero tolerance, and I will remind you before every exam. So, you know, if you have it, it's because you were either completely spaced out or you were actually trying to slip something by. Okay, assignments. The things that your grade is made up of. First, lecture assistance. For most lectures, I'll have some kind of demonstration. And so if you come and we talk about it beforehand, go over and you help me during the lecture with something that we prepared before lecture, then you can get up to 1% extra credit on your final grade. But, you know, it can't be like, well, I'm in class and I say I need a volunteer, right? It's going to be something where we prepare beforehand. You're actually doing something more significant than just, okay, now spin, spin in the chair. So it's all participation. It's more, it's, more than that. Yeah, it's more than that, right. And you can only do that once. There's only five of us, so there's no clamoring. You know, you don't have to do it this week or next week, you know. But you can get 1% if you actually... You know, do the thing and know what you're doing as you're doing it. And it's here for the, is that for the lab? That, that's for lecture. Lecture? Okay. Yeah. So that's, it says EC, but it's up to 1%. And up to 1%, I usually give 1%, but if somebody just like comes in and like, um, I don't remember, um, what am I supposed to do? You know, that's how you get less than 1% of your extra credit. Potential test questions. For every lecture and... If I have some in here, which I do, they're all wet. <laughs> Great. For every lecture where I'm talking about stuff, I'm going to have you write a question that you think would be an appropriate test question. And it needs to be multiple choice, and you fill it out in this form, and you turn it in. And then I go through and I grade those for quality. Quality is not too hard, not too easy. Right, if it's so easy that everyone can get it right, even if they didn't know anything about physics, well, that's a lower grade. If it's so hard that only you and no one else is going to get it right, that's also not as good a quality question. Then there's relevance. It needs to be something that I lectured on in class, not something that you found in a textbook or some other source, but is something that I lectured about. What was that? For every lecture? For every lecture, yeah. And then originality. The originality score, if I find that that question is in the textbook, you get a zero. Right. Right. Because I want it to be a question you made up, not one that you found. I know. Let's say you make one up and it happens to be in the book. It, it's unlikely. Okay. And then the other thing is, with only five people, this is really easy. If somebody else has fundamentally the same question, then I lower the score by one for each person. And if three people have, then it's lowered by two. And so that's, you know, you want to make sure your question is something that's, that's reasonably unique, not, not something that would be everyone has the same question. And total is adding them up. <laughs> Just, you know, it's not a separate score. Are we going to get more of these? Yes, I will print more and give you more. Yeah. Nope, you got those and you got to do all 40 of them on those. No. Okay, quizzes. Periodically, I try to do them once a week. I generally don't make it once a week, but it's my goal. 
I will give you a quiz. And the quiz will cover material from the last three lecture periods. And it will be exclusively questions that you guys wrote. So those questions that you're writing will be used on the quizzes. These ones, so can we yeah. take a picture of them? Sure. And then share them with each yeah. other? Um, <laughs> if you like, yes. Oh, so like, is that cheating? No. Okay. It's good that she asked, right? It's, it's better to do that and say, ha-ha, I think you've got a scheme. Um, yes, and in fact, I will put a little red mark on the corner of the ones that go into the test database. Okay. So you could actually, you know, slim when it down. When we get them back. Yeah, okay. which will be quickly. I will return them both on Moodle and on... Oh, so we'll be able to see everybody's on Moodle? No, only yours. Oh. So you would have to so, share. Yeah, it would be better right. for the rest of Right, because I, I, I can't in good conscience give you somebody else's graded right. paper. Right. But if they want to share with you, that's their prerogative. So the, the quiz is, com is completely made up of these questions? Yep. Okay. Now, the exams will be about half made up of those questions as well. So those questions will come up both on exams and on quizzes. Homework, there will be homework due every Wednesday, except for this week. Question. Question. Um, do you know which day approximately the quizzes are going to be? No, they're, they're unannounced. The idea is you're always ready. We love that. <laughs> right. They, for all classes, you should be always ready. It, it's a trap people fall into. Oh, I have a test in this class, so I'm not going to stay those ones this week and really focus on this one. But that in, impairs your learning overall. So you should, in all your classes, just stay up to date. And so that's why they're unannounced, so you'll stay up to date instead of yo-yoing. Right? There is pedagogical reason for just about everything in the class, including the one that really students hate. Um, the final exam is cumulative. My goal is for students to actually learn stuff and retain it throughout the semester. And so the final exam will cover all of the semester. If we're really struggling, is there a way for you to help us? Yes. Like, I'm um, not good with science at all. So if I'm really struggling by the final exam, are you going, to, like, or like if the whole class in general is struggling, <laughs> will you be more lenient when you're grading, or will you be more like, oh, yeah, I should write it out of this? Or? The, um, in terms of grading, the grading is always going to be just multiple choice. There's no leniency there. There's, is it right or is it not right? Okay. Um, Besides that, I, or true, there might be true false questions. Then. What's that? Besides that, right. one way to make extra credit then, if we like write you a paper on what we're studying that week, could we get extra credit points based on that? I won't rule it out. Okay. It's not something that I generally view favorably. That my problem with extra credit is that it can make a mockery of your class. Mm -hmm. um, an example from my own experience, when I was an undergraduate, I was taking a class, and I was like, 30% higher than most of the students. And there was another student who was like 50% higher than most of the students. And so the teacher gave us an extra credit assignment, and the two of us were like, we're guaranteed to get A's, right? We're so much higher than everyone else. So we didn't do the extra credit. The teacher made that extra credit with like 20%. Actually, it was more than that. Because I ended up getting an A minus, because the extra credit moved these students that were way down here up above me. And you know, what's the point of having the class that makes an extra credit assignment that it's worth more than all the tests combined, you know. And so I try to keep my extra credit to a very minimal amount. Um, we've already talked about the one, the lecture assistance, and then there's the attendance is my other um, extra credit that I do. And I, I could be talked into others, but I try not to. Now, on the helping, I'm always, I have class from 10 to noon, and then Tuesday afternoon, Thursday afternoon. Afternoon, other than that, if I'm in my office, come in, because I I love to help students. That's actually why you're going to teaching, right? <laughs> you, you don't go into teaching because you want to march students down. You just want to see them learn. And so I'm always available. You know, if I'm in there, I'm, I'm available pretty much to help you. Because I want you to succeed. Okay, back to homework. Homework assignments are due every Wednesday. Starting next Wednesday. I do every Wednesday students. Yeah. And there are two different times. If you want to turn it in as a physical paper copy, you need to turn it in to my office, which is right there across the hall, by 5 p.m. Or if you want to scan it 
to a single PDF file, you can upload on Moodle anytime before midnight Wednesday night. So you have more time for the upload than you have for the paper copy. I'm trying to encourage everyone to do it online. Um, you prefer we do it online? I, I prefer you do it online, yes, because then it's very easy. It was turned in at this time, and then I grade it. And Are the assignments digital? Or are you going to well, turn it giving they're, No, they're, some students do type them out. Oh, and, and like answer that, questions? But like yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, with the homework, you need to give reasons for your answers. Some questions are, are kind of yes, no. You can't just say yes and go on. You have to have a reason why it's yes. So if you just answer yes and it's correct, you'll get one out of 10. It's the reasoning behind that that gives you the rest of it in the homework. And same thing for calculating numbers. The answers for most of these are in the back of the book. So if you just put 6.12, how do I know that you did anything you understand where that number comes from? So you have to have your reasoning show your work of how you got the name, that number. Yes? If it's, a, if it's a number related problem, can we take a picture of our work? Yes. Yeah. Like that for the okay, that yeah. would count? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, if I, if I see the work or I see explanation, that's what most of the grade does with. Because we want to learn things, not just get right answers. Yeah. Okay, laboratory, our laboratory experiments. Um, I see that, and of course, I don't know people's names yet. I'll figure it out sooner or later. Alex has her lab book there, and it has um, pages that you tear out, which, you know, it's really unfortunate, but that's the way they go so that they can sell the book so, you know, don't, you can't reuse them. Yet. Anyway, so you'll do those pages and turn them in before you leave each day. Each lab? Each lab period, yes. So and when you leave, don't? you are completely done. Okay. And if we don't? Well, if, if you don't, there's a problem. Because you, you should easily be able to finish oh, okay. over time. Okay, they're not gonna be like so hard that I'm over here like, what are they saying? They no, shouldn't be, and of course, you will have a lab to you. Actually, you won't be able to be here for the first hour and a half because of time on foot, but I will be here the entire time as well. To <laughs> help answer questions. And what if our lab book isn't here before our first lab on Thursday? Um, I can give you a, a copy. Okay. I, I can't do that throughout the semester right. because that would be dishonest. But you know, if you have an order that's not here, yeah, not okay. okay, so midterm exams are 30% of your grade. And like I said, we'll see in just a minute when I get to it if there's two or three midterm exams. The final exam is 20% of your grade. There's three. The, there's three. Okay. And I call them midterm exams. I try to change my terminology to interim because some students think midterm means at the halfway point since mid is half. I've always used mid to mean in the midst, any time between beginning and ending. Just don't want to confuse people. The attendance. That is the one area where I give a person tried. And so my effort grade here is a 2% yes or no extra credit. If you have what I consider perfect attendance, you get 2% bonus. Perfect attendance. I take this from, actually it was a nursing policy, I thought it was a school I policy first, but they allowed you to have one excused absence per day of the week you have lecture. So we have three lectures a week, so throughout the semester you could have three excused absences. So if you have no more than three absences, I don't take into account was that excused or not, I just say the first three are the excused ones. Okay. And if you have no more than three absences, then you get a 2% bonus to your final grade. Even if they're excused or not? Whether they're excused or not, right? It's that, I, that way I just don't have to be some kind of judge like, oh, yeah, you were really sick, you know. It's, so the way I actually do the attendance is I will take attendance every day. If you're, show, if you're here and ready for class, at the time class begins, you get three points. If you are within five minutes of on time, you get two points. If you are later than five minutes or if you're doing something like using your phone during class, or I've had students do this, you go to the cafeteria, get some food, come back during class, well, then you get one point. And so three absences would be nine points. If at the end of the semester you're within nine points of the maximum number of points, you get 2%. Otherwise, you don't. Question? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you're 
Um, during preview days, I know I specifically get really involved in Thursday afternoons or when mm -hmm. like we have our labs yeah. and that's when we have tours. Uh -huh. So I would be missing that for every yeah. preview. And with, with the lab, I am I'm more generous. We, we can make it up. It won't be a problem. Question. Uh, you said within five minutes. Do you mean five minutes to ten or five minutes after? After. after. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't have to be five minutes before class starts. Be here and ready when class starts. Okay. <clears throat> this here is just descriptions of the things we've already talked about, so I can go past those. This is how I determine your final grade, and I round. So when it says 93%, 92.5% will round up to 93%. Okay, so any questions about just the syllabus document we've talked about? Question. Is the class going to be hard? That is a very personal question. For some people, it's super easy. For some people, it's not. So it depends on how you, how your brain works with scientific ideas. I, you know, my goal is clearly no, but I can't just say, oh, yeah, you're high, you'll find it easy because some people find it hard and some people don't. Okay, this here is the schedule that you have in your syllabus. And what this tells you is what we're covering. So today, Monday, January 13, we're doing prologue, introduction to physical science class. What are we doing on Wednesday? You can all read. Force and inertia. Force inertia, which is chapter 1, section 1 through chapter 1, section 7. And then what are we doing for lab on Thursday this week? Sonic Ranger. Sonic Ranger, which is page 11 in your lab notebook. Okay. So you have the first homework assignment. There's the first homework assignment. Yeah, what is that? Um, if you look on Moodle, homework one is the only one that's there. But it has the question numbers and it has the questions listed okay. out. That would be due by 5. You said 9 p.m.? If you do it on paper then it's 5 p.m. under my door. Yeah. If you turn it in online, it's due before midnight. Mm -hmm. And that's the HWO one yeah. that's due next Wednesday? Yes. And so this shows you when it's due. And now we can see in red, exam one, physics, exam two, chemistry, exam three, geology, meteorology. As you told us, there's three midterm, interim exams. Change my, I see it says midterm there too. I'm trying to change. And then we have the final exam that is cumulative. Yes? Do you know for education major, majors, if there's a minimum we have to get in this class? You need to get a C. Like a C or a C minus? No, a C. If we, if we get C minus, you have to oh my God. Do not stress. If God be for you, who can be against you? This class. No, this class is all for you. All right. So. Now getting started on actual material for the class, unless there's any other questions about the procedures of the class. No, okay. Um, yes? No? Okay. We're looking at the preview. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I know this doesn't mean. I'm proud. Um, so they have to be excused absences. That's what you said. No, the first three I just assumed those were the excuses. Doesn't matter. Ones. So even if I'm like sick and I just don't go to the nurse to get an excuse, it's still okay. Right, but, it, but it's only the first three. Like, yeah, so, the first three. Yeah. And then so after what? that, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And then after that, if we do need an excused one, I, except for in extreme cases, um, well, like I, I just say the first three are the excused ones. And then after that, and then after that, there are excuse ones. Even if we've so, gotten, like, yeah, even if we've got like right. sick or work or yeah. So so that's I, I have that policy of the first three are the excused ones, so I don't have to sit here and be a judge. Now, were you really your, you know, it's okay. yeah. And if there if you have like extended illness, well, then I'm going to have to make a change. I mean, if it's if it's work or I mean specifically mm -hmm. for preview days, or yeah. if you're sick, I don't think that should count against you, even if it's not on your first three. But but you shouldn't be having more than three of those, right? That we shouldn't have. I mean, sickness you can't control. You know, extracurriculars like work, we should not be harming our students' education with their work. 
What if it's a family thing? Like, I have custody of my sister, so once mm -hmm. a month I have to fly home. Um, that, that would be something that's extraordinary. Okay. Right, that, that's not a typical situation. Okay, our topics here, that's actually chapter one topics. We're not going to do chapter one today, so I'm not going to spend time on these topics. I'm going to go right to how we define science. Science is defined as information that we learn via the scientific method. Now, I have two scientific methods for you, and the second one is the one that is the one you have to memorize. This is not the one you have to memorize. This is the one in the textbook. Everybody's going to have a slight different variation on what they call the scientific method. But they all have to have the same fundamental things. So the scientific method starts by observing something. If you don't see things and feel curious about them, well, then you're not really scientifically minded. Because that's the essence of science, is seeing something occur and saying why. So, you know, kids, kids often are asking why. That's a very scientific thing, asking why. And so it drives me crazy when I see people say, because I said so. Or, you know, they, they, they try to stop the, student, the kids from asking why. Because that's, that's the essence of science, is observing something and wondering, why does that happen? And so then the rest of the scientific method is how we go about coming to an answer. So this has step two question. I call it make a hypothesis. Um, you make an educated guess as to why it occurred. And this educated guess, we have a term for a hypothesis. So that's a, a vocabulary word. A hypothesis is an educated guess to explain why something happened. So you said this isn't the one we have to memorize. That's right. This is not the one you have to memorize. Um, yeah, the next slide is the one you have to memorize. But the terms here are still important, right, and, and understanding what the pieces are. So this is a little more detailed than the one you have to memorize. So you make a hypothesis, and as we'll see on the next one, that hypothesis has certain restrictions. You can't just say, well, I think that the sky is white because snow is white. Well, actually, because snow is white, it's almost going to be okay. But you, you, can't, you can't just give an answer. There has to be some reasons for it that I will elucidate on the next slide. Then the next one is predict. Your hypothesis needs to make predictions about what would happen in different situations. Not just the same situation, because you've already covered that base. It needs to predict in different situations what's going to happen. And then you test those predictions. The essence of science is you're coming through, you're making these predictions, and then you test them. Test to see if they're true. If your test matches your prediction, you didn't just prove yourself right. You confirmed, hey, in this specific situation, my hypothesis gave a correct prediction. But to prove yourself right, you would have to make predictions of every possible situation. We're all smart enough to know it's not possible to make predictions for every single possible situation that can occur in the universe. So scientifically, we can never prove ourselves correct. But we can prove ourselves wrong. Because if my hypothesis makes a prediction in this situation that that's not what happens, then I know my hypothesis is incorrect. So you can, when you do the test, you either confirm your hypothesis, which makes you more confident but doesn't say it's right, or you disprove it where you know your hypothesis is wrong. Step five here is one that I'm not quite as comfortable with, draw the conclusion. The scientific process never ends because you never can prove yourself right. You can just go through and test again and again, and confidence grows to where you're reasonably confident to completely confident, but still you don't know for sure that you're right. So take something very simple like gravity. We have a, huh, oh, my tennis ball is not in here. Well, it's going to be golf ball today then. We have an understanding of gravity. We say that there is a force of gravity 
between the earth and this ball, and that force makes it, if I drop it, go down. It's been tested literally millions or billions of times. It's never been shown to be incorrect. Is it proven correct? No, it cannot be proven correct. But we're all sure it's right. So we consider that a very strong theory, one that we're sure is right, even though we can't prove it's correct. Now, if there's one experiment that, experiment that shows it's wrong, then we have to toss it. We have to modify somehow and get to the right answer. And so, now, you should know I am a creationist. I believe that God created life from this earth. But experimentally, we can't test if God created life on this earth. Right? How are you going to test that? There's, there's really no way. So that's not a scientific belief. It's a belief I have, but it's not scientific. So not all beliefs are scientific. And just because it's not scientific doesn't make it a lesser belief. So in this class, we're going to be looking at science and understanding how science comes to understand knowledge. But that doesn't mean that that's the only way, but it is the way we do understanding our physical world, the world we live in. So here is the list that you do have to memorize. Step one, observe something interesting. Pretty much the same as right. the last one. Step one was observe, close observe, physical world, around you, recognize a question or a puzzle, such as that one. Pretty much the same thing, just more succinct. Step two, create a hypothesis, and you need to know these three things the hypothesis has to satisfy. So thing number one, it needs to explain why the thing you observed occurred. So it needs to explain, you know, if I say, ah, oh, the sky is white today, it needs to explain why the sky is white today. Then two, it needs to be based on scientific ideas. That is, you're building on knowledge that somebody else has already determined scientifically. So, for instance, if I say the sky is white today, I say it's white because we have a bunch of small particulates in the air, and the light is, well, probably not, they're probably ice crystals because it's cold out, right? If it wasn't ice crystals, we'd say, we have me scattering, and me scattering is known to scatter all colors equally. And since the sun is white, shocker, right? It's a lot of people need yellow. Now, since the sun is white, we have this white light that's being scattered everywhere, and so the sky looks white. So I have a scientific reason. It's based on scientific ideas. And then the third thing it must do is it must make predictions that can be tested. If your hypothesis you know, is something like, because God made it that way, how can you test because God made it that way? It's not a scientific proposal. Doesn't mean it's incorrect, but scientific proposals, the hypothesis has to be something that makes a prediction that you can test. And then step three is a very simple test, a prediction of your hypothesis. Now remember, your hypothesis is predicting something other than your observation. So your test cannot be a repeat of your observation. That's one of the biggest problems students have on this on the test. They will put for their, on the test, for their test, the scientific method, they will repeat their observation. But you already knew that. It needs to make a prediction elsewhere. And then finally, step four is based on the outcome of the test. If your prediction is correct, then you go back and you test a different prediction or perhaps check test the same prediction in a different way. So you go back and test again if you confirm. But if your test proves it wrong, there's where we can use proof. You prove it wrong, then you go back with more information and create a better hypothesis based on more complete knowledge. Yes? Is the acronym that we need to know a photo? <laughs> I, I have never made a mnemonic for this. Um, Oto? Mm -hmm. O-H-T-O. Uh, okay. Oto, uh, like the Oto Indians. Um, you, you have to basically be able to reproduce this. So you have to remember the three pieces there in step two and the two pieces in step four. 
and the one in the field. Okay, questions about the scientific method? I will give you my favorite application of this, which of course is not going to be one of the tests because you are, if I give you something you already have, it doesn't test your ability to think clearly or reason. So, something that I believe I observed when I was a child working at the dairy. If I eat ice cream and I eat it at a Cold Stone Creamery, it tastes so much better than if I eat that eat ice cream at the dairy where we've got the milk cows. That's an observation, right? That's the first step. So the second step is to create a hypothesis that explains why it's based on previous scientific knowledge and based predictions. So my hypothesis is we know that smell is part of our sense of taste. And if you're at a Cold Stone Creamery, it smells oh so delicious. Whereas if you're at the dairy, the, quote, dairy air does not smell all that delicious. And so my hypothesis is that it tastes better at the Cold Stone Creamery because the air smells better. So it's based on scientific ideas. It's based on previous understanding about how the nose, you know, smelling affects taste. And then we need to make a prediction to test. So my prediction is simple. Now, am I doing the experiment? No. On the test, you're not doing the experiment. You're saying this is how we would test it. So how I test is I would take a room like this, and I put a bunch of little heaters that are covered. And in those heaters, I would put apple pie. So it makes a delicious apple pie odor. And then I would bring in unwitting students and give them a bowl of ice cream and have them rate that ice cream as how good does it taste. And then I send them out and I take all of those apple pies, I would eat them, and replace them on the heaters with cow pies. A distinctly different odor. And then I bring new people in and I give them ice cream from the same ice cream batch and have them eat it and rate how good it tastes. Now my prediction, my hypothesis, what would it predict about who rates the ice cream that's tasting better? The ones with apple pie. My hypothesis predicts the ones that have smelled apple pie will say, well, ice cream tastes better. So if that occurs, if the people with the apple pie smell said, ah, oh, this ice cream is better, then I would confirm it and I would, the scientific process, come back and have to come up with another test of a prediction or a different prediction. And that's where you would end on the test for that option. But what if the people say that, you know, the ratings of the taste are the same, or, God forbid, that it tastes better when you have the cow pies and apple pies in the air? Then I disprove my hypothesis. So then I would have to go back to step two and come up with a new hypothesis. It must not be because of the better smell, and I have to have a new hypothesis. So on the test, you won't, you won't propose a second hypothesis in case it's wrong. You'll just say, I have to go back and come up with a new hypothesis. First, Alex, which question? Uh, uh, when the people come into part of the experimentation too, like how much they like ice cream, so would you have to jump back if the, if the difference could be explained by the fact that people are different? Um, the, that is an important part of experimental design. You have to have enough people so that the, you know, the, the sample is balanced. What was your question? Um, why do you have your preferred scientific method? to use the one that Because there's lots of scientific method, method variations here minus a simpler form. Okay. And it's the, the, key, the key thing here is you understand this is how we get scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. if, if you got it through steps like this, then it's scientific. Otherwise, it's correct or incorrect, but it's not science. Okay, this is just vocabulary words. And by the way, I actually have last year's versions of these slides already on Moodle like for the whole semester. Um, but you, you will have the slides available to you, so you don't have to so like, take pictures or copy yet. So, in fact, a fact is something that all observers can agree on. You know, things like, you know, 
this room has a soft white light. It's not blue, it's more yellowish, so it's soft. You know, that's what a fact is, we can all agree on. Hypothesis and educated guess. A theory. We start with a hypothesis after we've tested a number of times and we get more confident in it, that's when it advances to a theory. So a theory, it started as a hypothesis, it's been tested a lot, and now we have some confidence in it, we call it a theory. And then we have a law. A law, like Newton's laws that we'll learn, is a general, I said hypothesis or statement. It's, it's obviously, it starts a hypothesis and it's gone well beyond that. That is tested very well over a very broad range. And a law usually can be expressed as a simple mathematical equation. I don't have that written here. And I do have written also known as a principle. Principle is not quite as broad as the law. We're not going to worry about that. So I'm just not going to ask you about the word principle. We'll just have law as the vocabulary word. So a law is something that is a very well-tested theory that is very broad in what it covers and often can be expressed with a mathematical equation. So you're just going from hypothesis is not tested, theory tested, law really well tested. This here is taking quotes from the textbook about the difference between science and art and religion. Now our textbook is written by somebody who differs in opinion from me. And you will find there are lots of different ways people deal with religion and science. I have, okay, this, this here is what's called the um, non-overlapping magisteria. Theory. You do not need to know that. But the non overlapping magisteria or noma theory is that science and religion, I know art's up there too, science and religion are different realms. And so you can't have contradiction between them because they're not in the same realm. So our, our author, I'm not sure if it's in this text or another, goes so far as saying if somebody says that they're Religion contradicts science. They either don't understand religion or they don't understand science. That's that school of thought. It's not the one I have. Yes. Um, anything that's bolded, are we going to need to know? So are, like, um, are these part of vocab as well? The art, science, religion are not part of vocab. Okay. Um, I, I, I suppose I, I bold words that I consider important for their context and not necessarily just vocab. So what is my belief on this? It, it's fundamental, it's important for you as a person, I think, to address this. It's not something to address on a test, unless I'm you know, going into philosophy and having you prepare them. But I believe that God created this universe. I believe that he created the laws of the universe, and then he created life in this universe. And so everything that's scientific is an outcome of God's creation. And that there has to be, if understood correctly, agreement between my science and my religion. The problem is understanding correctly. I was just reading something yesterday on Quora where somebody asked about, you know, the earth being 6,000 years old according to the Bible. And somebody just ripped into it. What Bible are you reading? The Bible doesn't say that the earth is 6,000 years old. Well, what does the Bible say? It doesn't give a number. It does not give a number. So how did Bishop Usher come up with roughly 6,000 years? He added up all the names of mentioned people with their, with their ages, or at least estimated ages. Okay, so he takes, first of all, you have the genealogies in the Bible, you know, Adam lived so long and had Seth, and then Adam lived so much longer, and then Seth lived so long and he had Enos, and, and so on. And, and, and you go on and you add up the times, and then you get the flood came, and then you have the time between the flood and this, and you take between landmarks how long it was. And you come up with a pretty good estimate, you know, plus or minus, let's say that the years aren't quite right. You're still going to be within 1,000 years, right? And so you can say within 1,000 years easily from Adam to now. 
Are any of the questions going to be changed in where we're using more of the spiritual sense than we are the scientific sense? No. Any? Okay. No, this is a scientific class, but, but thinking about and understanding what, what is science and how religion relates to it is, it's not a tested thing, okay. but it's an important thing. So, the Usher's chronology is based on a good sound reading of the Bible, unlike what that guy in Korah was saying. There are still questions like, when does he start Adam's age? You know, I, I don't know. Was it at creation? Was you know, was creation of the earth a different time than creation of life? There's lots of questions in there. And the Bible, we can all agree, the purpose of the Bible was not to say when creation occurred. It's to tell us about God and for us to understand God. And so, you know, there, there's different people who put different emphases on these things. I am out of time, so I will... Talk about yes, which is going to be over the scientific method, obviously. Oh, um, okay. There's a lot of pressure involved in these questions. We don't know our box numbers. Um, since we only have five, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. Today's the thirteenth. Today's the thirteenth. Um. Wow. I'm